that'd be fine. I'll, I'll let you call the, or do the uh, start of the meeting and then we'll, we'll have him chime in later on. Okay, um, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Um, did we have minutes to go over or was it in our packets? We actually did not include those. Um, we took a lot of things off of the uh, meeting. That's fine. Then we just agenda just because of the time frame that everybody wanted to hold it to hopefully an hour and there was so much else on the agenda. So any little thing we could, we took off. So, okay. <laughs> but we will get those out on the next meeting. No problem. Um, before we get started, I just like to, to make sure everybody knows and uh, shares my condolences to Dave McDowell. His dad passed away with uh, COVID and he, I think he had uh, a funeral yesterday, but my heart and my prayers go with Dave and hopefully uh, the same for the rest of the group. And it, it's, I appreciate him being able to be on the, the call today. So thanks a lot, Dave. Um, let's do the roll call. Christina? Yes, I was just checking to make sure he wasn't trying to call in. Uh, okay. okay, Mr. Zach? Here. Ms. McCandless? Here. Mr. Land? Here. Mr. McDonald? Here. Mr. McDowell? Here. Mr. Looney? Here. Mr. Porter? <clears throat> Doesn't seem like he's here today, so I, I hope he's. So. <laughs> I hope he's doing okay. Well, I think our first presentation is utility abatement for. Um, I think that's uh, COVID vaccination center. Chief Shorts on, I believe. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank all of you for letting me in. I'm Doug Short. I'm the fire chief, of course, for the uh, city of Independence. Also, my second and third jobs and fourth jobs is also dealing with uh, disaster response preparedness for the city of, uh, of independence. Um, as you guys are well aware, we're still heavy into the emergency for COVID. And one of the things that I have been at, tasked with, or I would like to come in is to talk to you about um, some support that we could use in our efforts um, for vaccination. Um, one of the things with our newly reformed health department that we're doing is we will be taking up vaccinations um, and handling vaccinations for not only employees, but then as we move forward into the different phases and tiers of the uh, vaccination for all, all everyone, um, we'll be part of that effort. Um, we were recently offered by the Independent Center of Mall Management um, a space inside of the independent center that is about 13,000 square feet that we could utilize to do a mass vaccination clinic, um, which for us, while we have other locations, um, that is a probably a more preferred location for us because not only does it have a lot of parking, um, it has indoor capabilities for lines if we have to deal with that, but it also has uh, the particular space has an indoor outdoor access as well. So we have multiple ways to utilize that facility and space. Um, as part of that agreement, what the offer was, was that they um, would give us that space rent free. However, the only thing that they would ask would be for utilities. Um, as with everything that we're dealing with in COVID, nothing is budgeted. Um, and we are in a point to where um, while we had CARES Act that we probably could have put this under after the uh, at towards the end of last year, we don't have that available. What I'm asking or what I, I would like to request from the PUAB is, and, and then ultimately going on to the council, is that you guys give us a positive recommendation to approve a temporary abatement of $1,000 a month to the independent center for the uh, uh, utility uses there, um, as long as we use that facility. Um, right now we're anticipating probably at about five months by the time you give first shots to second shots um, and phasing that occurs. 
um, we would anticipate it would last about that long. There is the possibility that, um, as with all disaster, we can work towards getting um, public assistance. In other words, trying to get some of that money refunded back through the disaster declaration, the federal disaster declaration. But um, I will, as you probably have been aware, if you've been on the board, anytime a disaster happens, that's always touchy. Sometimes we get what we want back from the Fed. Sometimes we don't get what we want. Um, but we always put it in, and that's important. Just as an example, um, probably in the last five years, just for IPL, we've gotten over $1.6 million recovered in disaster recovery money that my EP department coordinates and facilitates for all the departments in the city. So, you know, it, it, it's not something unusual for us to do something of this nature. So as in my memo, just to keep it brief, then what I'm asking for is just for a, uh, a recommendation for approval from this advisory board um, that I can forward on with a potential resolution on the next council meeting for us to be able to waive those utilities. So moved. Uh, was that a motion? Yes, sir. Okay, B Brenda made the motion, is there a second? I seconded Joe Zach. Okay, uh, is there any discussion? Yes, sir, this is I Dave McDowell. Uh, I have a real problem with this. I I've already discussed this with several other people that are not city people, just people who live here. And the very first thing that came up I said, you know, I've been told that we're going to probably rent space at Independence Center. And it, I know that you guys are saying it's just utility bills, but $1,000 a month is renting space at Independence Center. I have a problem with that when we have a facility that's owned by the city that has adequate parking, has adequate space for people to stand in line, and actually has seats in place so you don't have to rent chairs. I think it's a terrible waste of money when we have a facility that's absolutely free to the city of Independence. And I'm talking about the event center. So I can't support this. Sorry. I, you know, we, we're, we're throwing money around like it's no big deal. It is a big deal. Someone has to earn that money. And $1,000 a month is a lot of money when we have a free facility that we can use. Just my two cents. I have a question for uh, Chief Short. Does, did the city, um, was there thought process that they would foot the bill through the, the general fund or some fund other than the utility fund? Well, at this point, like I said, this is unbudgeted. So there really is no fund that it could come out of other than to just abate part of their bill at this point. Okay. Did we consider the event center? Yeah, the, the, the reason we wouldn't do that is because the daily setup and takedown um, it is, exp is extensive that we have to do for this. Um, the event center does still have events that occur during this time period. So we would have to take down everything every day if there is a hockey game or if there's you know, any other event at the, the event center um, to do that. This, this makes the flow a lot easier so that, you know, the majority of all that labor that does that every day is volunteer labor. And to get them to set up and take down these events is quite extensive. And to get the volunteers to do that over a long period of time would be very difficult. We, we deal with that in testing right now, just doing it at, at the independence athletic complex to do actual COVID testing. I mean, it, it takes an extensive amount of time just to do three hours in a week. Um, so for us to have a seven day a week vaccination clinic, um, it would be very difficult for us to use that center. Or the Sermon Center? Well, the problem with the Sermon Center and Truman Memorial Building, again, is because the Sermon Center is open to some of those activities. And Truman Memorial, we would have to have a special we'd have to get an agreement with the church to use the parking because there's not enough parking there sure. uh, as well. I understand. Any other discussion? I have a question for Mr. Short. 
This is Jack Looney. Oh, go ahead, Jack. Yes, sir. In your in your response, you said that the event center had some activity scheduled. How many schedules are we talking about? That would say how many takedowns and setups we'd have to do. Uh, that I I would have to get with the event center because that's handled through the you know parks and recreation tourism. Um, I'm not sure exactly how many events they have. We just we've been advised there are a lot of. Now we have considered that, and when we were in a full shutdown of the city, and no operations were being allowed at the event center, we were utilizing it for that. Um, but now that we're letting that revenue open back up in the event center um, to, you know, have that, it's based on how the uh, company that works for Parks and Rec is scheduling it. And the personnel used to set up and take down, is that volunteer help or is that paid help? I mean, there's there's some paid help. There's some of us directors that are volunteering our time because, you know, we're mostly salary anyways, and this is stuff we're doing on our own. Um, but other than that, it's volunteers, either through my EP staff that are volunteers or Medical Reserve Corps that are volunteers. And, and we've been, they've been volunteering now for almost, we're getting coming up on a year in dealing with all of these different opportunities and situations that we're dealing with. Thank you. This is Mr. McDowell again. Uh, Mr. Short, <clears throat> are yes. you all renting, are you renting chairs for people to set in after they get their shots? No, we, we have chairs available from when we have the health department. We'll have chairs available. The only thing that, we, that we're gonna have a, a cost output on this right now is some minor administrative costs, paper, pencils, pens, and the, uh, the utilities. You know, labor is mostly volunteer. The vaccinations are provided by the federal and state government and a lot of the supplies that come with that. A lot of our PPE we have to still provide, but some of that also has been provided as well. Do you have an estimate on how many people you're going to be giving shots to per hour? Well, I, Christina Heinen would probably have to be more, I'm kind of more of the logistics side of it, but you know, that's all gonna be dependent upon how much vaccine the state gives us on a weekly basis. And you if you haven't read or heard the news, that's pretty unreliable at this point. <laughs> the, the part that bothers me about this is if, if you're giving 500 shots an hour, you, you've got to have a minimum of 125 chairs for people to sit in for 15 minutes. Sure. And Yeah, that, that space wouldn't allow that many shots per hour. If I, if I was gonna get a, give an estimate, the maximum number that we could probably do in an hour is probably gonna be closer to about 60 to 70 if we're able to get that many vaccines in it for a week. So let's, let, let's put the pencil to this real quick. So if we give 60 an hour, you're talking one a minute, how many hours are you gonna be open? We're gonna, we're gonna do mostly mall hours. That, so, that too what also is dependent upon whether we have volunteers capable of being there all the time. Well, I can tell you that we're going to be giving shots for a couple of years at the rate we're going to be giving them. And, and I, the I, don't, <laughs> I don't disagree with you on some of those those cases, and I won't argue with you on that. But I'm, my job is to set up for the preparedness part of it as much as I can. Well, here, here's what I'm getting to, into is the fact that if, if it's going to take that long to administer shots and we're going to be doing this for a long period of time, I don't want to commit the city of Independence $1,000 a month to the shopping center that, frankly, I don't feel safe going to anymore. And I live less than a mile away from it. And there's just, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just not in favor of this. I think that if you're thinking that our event center can't handle this in the daytime, it, it's foolish. I mean, there's no events that take place in that center in the, in the middle of the day. I do not know what it takes to set up, but there's no chairs that are having to be set up. And if there's no events, 
I mean, right now we're averaging less than 10 events a month at the center. And those events are in the evening. And I think we could probably work around that because this is an emergency. And I'm just not in favor of us spending $1,000 a month for something that may drag out for two years. That's a $25,000 outlay of money, and I can't endorse it. Uh, can I interrupt real quick? Uh, Christina, could you send the link to Larry Porter again? He, he says he didn't get it. And, and for this discussion, I just pulled up the uh, arena tickets, independence venue. And according to this, April 2nd is the first, the first time that uh, the Mavericks are here. And then Russ, whoever Russ is, is May 18th and June 12th, July 17th, and October 30th. I don't know if that helps anyone with that. No, we we have we have events this weekend. We have events on on Friday and Saturday of this weekend. But well, I'm just of, about what Ticketmaster has. Yeah, well, Ticketmaster probably isn't selling tickets because both clubs have sold enough tickets that they're only allowed to sell 1,600 tickets per event. Okay, so this is inaccurate. I just wanted to drop that yes, in. It is inaccurate. But we're only there's typically only about 10 events per month taking place in that arena. And for us to to pay, the part that scares me, if, you know, if we're only talking $5,000 in cabinet five, I'd go along with that. But we're not going to get independence taken care of in five months. Not if we're only giving 60 shots an hour. Well, this is, just, this, is, this is not the only site. You know, Truman, Truman Medical Center is one site. Um, there's... Uh, uh, St. Luke's is another site. Uh, Jackson County is another site. This is not the only site that independent residents can go to. So it's it's not we're not talking about two years by any means. If we're talking about two years, we're gonna this you know we're basically everybody's going to be vaccinated uh, by June or July or August of, of this year. Uh, so. You know, I disagree with you. I, I would. Has anyone here been in the service? Were you in the service? When in the service, they give us your shots with an air gun, and you know you can line you can line thirty people up and in less than four minutes give thirty people shots. That's the way we probably should be administering this instead of these individual shots the way we're doing it. But one a minute. My God, what a terrible rollout that is. And once again, I don't feel safe at Independence Center. Well, that, and I'm a big that, guy. I mean, that's that's the each and a person's decision if they want to go there, if they want to go to Truman, or if they want to go someplace else. Nobody's forcing them to go to the Independence Center. Vice Chair Jack Looney with the question. Jack, did you say something? I'm sorry. Yes, I had a question for Chief Thor. Okay. Yes, in the discussion, I thought I understood that if we commit to this, it'd be a thousand dollars a month, but there's no assurance that we'd have the supplies to keep the doors open. Is that what I heard? Yeah, that's that's a well with everything. However, there is the alternative. You know, if we're not doing tests or if we're not doing vaccinations we can always turn that over to tests because we're able capable of getting tests as well so you know it's not going to be empty I and mean, we're going to be working with these other partners st luke's truman because independent center does offer some opportunities busing routes things of that nature um, open to the public where those people will see it as opposed to having to go to a hospital to do it that do open the door to potentially get more people vaccinated. Is it possible to sunset this so that after three months it requires the city council to assess how many people are getting shots and make a decision again at that point? You could do a limited authorization for that short period of time. Most definitely.
can I amend my motion for a limited approval for three months for the um, city to partner with the health department to be sure that they're able to give shots? I'll second it. So do we, uh, is this time, do we need to do a vote? Christina, did you get a hold of Larry? I did send him the link again. Okay. And it looks like it was sent the first time, but maybe he didn't receive it on his end for some reason. I understand. And uh, if there's no more discussion, you could definitely call for the roll. Okay, let's call for a roll. Larry Porter. Mark McDonald. No. Jack Looney. No. Garland Land. Yes. Joe Zach. Yes. David McDowell. No. Bridget McCandless? Yes. So we have three no's and three yeses. Mr. Porter, are you on the call? He called me, he called me uh, Christina earlier and said he couldn't he didn't have the link so I don't know what the status is. Yeah, I did I forwarded him the link again um Thank to you. his email. So it doesn't look like it is someone coming on. I don't think I see anybody listed to come into the meeting. Okay. So it doesn't seem like the motion passed. So let's move on to the Sunshine Law training. Sarah on? Yep, I am on. Hi, Sarah. Hi, everybody. Christina, can you, can I share my screen? Is that possible? Or I think you might be able to, yes. Do you know how I do that? I see you, Sarah. That's all you guys need. <laughs> hold on, hold on. Or I might be okay. Let's see. Awesome. I think there's a little drop down. There you go. You guys see this? Yes, ma'am. All right. So I've been tasked with giving you guys a brief summary of the Missouri Sunshine Law. Um, in your packet, you should have a seven page, more detailed summary. Um, that's from my firm and this kind of it goes into more details than probably you really want to know i kind of like this stuff but you guys may not you know want to see it all um so i have a couple slides here and i will tell you i did add one slide at the end that you do not have but christina has it and she will email it out after the meeting so let's just go through these pretty quick here and i can you know if you have questions please feel free to um to ask them anytime and you guys can see the slides, right, on their screen, or if you're if you're looking at your computer. Okay. Are you guys seeing this? Just want to make sure. Yes. Okay. Cool. So you know what is the Sunshine Law? The Sunshine Law is composed in Chapter 610 of the Missouri Revised Statutes. Now this was originally passed in 1973, and I'm sure you all all know either from school or can remember that. Uh, the same time we had the situation called the Watergate. And so in order for states to give govern or to give make sure the government is giving the public ample opportunity to participate in meetings, to have access to public records, they proposed the Freedom of Information Act federally, and then each state adopted their own um, sunshine law, so to speak. This I think there's some different names around the different states. But what this is is just to Say, hey, records are open, come ask if you want them. Um, so what is subject to the Sunshine Law? Basically, 
everybody, everybody is subject to the Sunshine Law. Um, public governmental bodies, committees, boards, advisory boards, um, commissions, uh, quasi governmental bodies as well. So all of those types of boards are all subject to the Sunshine Law. There's a couple exceptions to this. Um, of course, if there's an informal social setting uh, and there's happens to be less than a quorum of a board or commission present and they, you know, casually discuss business, that cannot be that that's not probably subject to the Sunshine Law. But you got to remember that those sort of informal gatherings could immediately become a meeting if you start getting quorum present. Um, and of course, an exception to the exception is that, you know, if you're trying to use these informal social meetings uh, to kind of circumvent the sunshine, sunshine law, then that could be viewed as a violation of the sunshine law. What it covers. So sunshine law covers public meetings, public business, public records, public votes. To be on the safe side, you should assume everything that you guys discuss that city related is subject to the sunshine law. Moving on to public meeting procedures, and most of you know this, you know, we have to give notice of a public meeting and the meeting has to be held at a reasonable time and place. Uh, keep in mind, just because it's a time and place that may be reasonable, it's it may not work really well. For example, we I have heard a city city held a you know a board meeting at someone's home. Well, the time was right, the the there was plenty of space for everyone, but there was public that just didn't feel comfortable coming into these this private home, so it wasn't very well attended, and and that wouldn't be in a proper place. Luckily, we don't do that very often, so that's good. Um, public meetings, um, including meetings conducted by telephone, internet, or other electronic means, have to be held at a reasonable time and it has to be accessible to the public. Um, Meetings should be held, if they're held in person, they should need to be held in facilities that are large enough to accommodate an anticipated attendance. If it's gonna, there's a hot agenda item and you think there's gonna be 100 people, well, you better make sure that there's room for everyone to be involved um, as, as, as best as we can, obviously. Sometimes we're limited by space. Uh, it's also make sure that the, the facility is accessible to persons with disabilities. Obviously, we're required to post a notice uh, and a tentative agenda of each meeting. A tentative agenda is an agenda that's constructed in a manner to advise the public of matters to be considered. While it's not a final agenda, uh, and we can bring up matters that may not be specifically on the agenda, but as long as that kind of correlates with the discussion or with what maybe has been discussed in previous meetings that we knew that was going to come up in the future, um, and of course, that's you know that is a that is kind of an item that we have talked about several occasions. And our bylaws obviously state that any item needs to be on the agenda. Um, obviously, we can also have emergency meetings. Uh, that the, that is an exception to the general requirements for the 24-hour notice. Uh, however, the notice has to be made as soon as possible. And when the meeting is conducted, the, emer the emergency must be noted in the minutes. And it's got to be for good cause. It can't just be, you know, we couldn't meet today. Let's meet tomorrow morning. And that's, you know, it's just a mere inconvenience time. It's got to be a good cause. And of course, have we, we have, as we discovered over this past year, um, we can hold public meetings electronically. Uh, these are treated just the same as regular meetings that are in person, which means we have to provide a space for public to come and listen to the meeting. When we do this meeting, obviously, it's on the um, uh, we, I think we've streamed on YouTube. I think it might be somewhere on the city's city seven, I think on, on the website. So that is the Missouri attorney general came out last March and said, allowing public to watch on TV was good enough, which was very interesting to me because I always thought we had to have a, a, a more participation type uh, venue, but they said TV is good enough. So here we are. And thank goodness, because Sometimes that's all this other cities can do. Sarah? Sarah? Yes, sir. Can I interrupt for just a second? Yeah. Uh, to let you know that uh, the media's not being broadcast right now. Somebody just sent me a, a, a message to that effect. Oh. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> what a time a timely uh, issue. <laughs> so. It is
Hello? Gotcha. Thanks, Steve. Hi, Larry. Hi, Hello. Larry. Larry, we're in the middle of the presentation on uh, the sunshine laws. Okay, so, go ahead, sir. I understand it. I'll listen. <laughs> you got it? Okay. Got so it. Uh, to finish up this slide, all roll call votes need to be that in a meeting must be done either in person or uh, for vi via, via video conferencing. So we got to see your face to make a roll call vote. Um, open meetings. Uh, elected officials must be physically present or participate by video conference for roll call wait, votes. Wait. Sarah? Yes, sir. Larry Porter. That, that means I can't vote today? No, that, like I was just saying, elected officials are, are subject to that physically present or participate oh, okay. by video conference. Okay. Yeah. Usually Sorry. commissions, no, you're fine. Commissions and committees that aren't, that don't include elected officials can do their board, their meetings just by telephone completely. Obviously, we like to see people's faces. So, but yeah. the um, the requirement for physically present or actual video conference for roll call votes is strictly for elected officials only. So, I okay. wanted to put that in there because we do try to keep everyone on video, but it, for the most part, it's only required for elected. Um, if a meeting is held by phone, we have to give access for the public, whether we give them this Teams Teams link or some sort of phone number to call in to listen. Uh, the you know the public can always record a meeting. I know people get a little twitchy when someone comes into a meeting with their camera on, but there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. They can always record. Uh, one one interesting uh, statement is public they do not have a right to speak at a meeting. Uh, the, the meetings are specifically for conducting business. In <coughs> business does not mean bless you does not mean you have to let public speak. Now of course there are other uh, statutory requirements for public hearings and that sort of, but, but that's nothing that this board currently does unless you want to hold a public hearing um, at your leisure. Um, if a body goes into a closed session, the public has to be given a place to wait. And of course, that kind of really applies to if you have an, an actual in-person meeting. Sarah, can I ask a question about that? Could, could we... Yes. Uh, uh, allow a space at our PUAB meeting for the public to speak? Yeah, you could. Actually, in your in your bylaws, the, on the, um, well, I guess it's kind of like a, an agenda outline, there's a spot for public comment. We just don't include it on our agendas. Thank you. I think it's a good point, Garland. Yeah. And then that would be something, I mean, obviously it's not required, but that'd be something that the board, if, the, if you all want to start including that, you know, I would take a board vote and see how every test, test everyone and see what they would like to do. Okay, the next slide is public voting procedures. Always record all votes. Christina knows this very well. Any, all, any roll call votes must be a yay, nay, or, abs or abstention, and that must be attributed to an individual member, hence a roll call vote. Uh, any votes taken during a closed meeting must be taken by roll call, roll call only. Closed meetings. So this, these are the top reasons for an advisory board to close. Uh, these are just these are a little bit different than what I would put on here for a city council or board of aldermen, because uh, some of some of the reasons wouldn't really apply to you all. Like uh, like the top top reasons to to close for a city council would be legal actions, real estate transactions, and personnel employment matters. Personnel employment matters don't really wouldn't be one you guys do, but I thought legal actions could definitely apply to you all. Uh, competitive competitive bid spec, specs, sealed bids, auditor communications, response plans, security systems. These sorts of things could be something if there if a topic arose that would fall under uh, that exception, we could close a meeting to talk about it. Um, obviously, it just doesn't happen very often with us. May I and ask if we, that yes. So when you take an action in a closed meeting, don't you have to also come out to open to report the any actions that were taken in the closed meeting? No. So that they are recorded in public document? No. So a closed meeting is just that. It is a closed, a closed for discussion. The votes are closed. The minutes are closed. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that in the Sunshine Law. One would be for personnel. If you know, if you were to fire somebody, uh, there is a, a 
I think you have to make the record available 72 hours after the vote. Uh, and that actually gives time to tell this person that they've been, you know, let go. Um, I think real estate transactions, uh, once once a real estate transaction is closed and done, uh, the vote and documents that were signed could be released at that point because they become open because it's been, it's you know, land's been sold or property has been purchased and it's been recorded with the recorder of deeds, so it's public anyway. Um, uh, obviously, legal actions, any sort of final disposition, that would be your that would be your open record for that. But as far as any sort of like attorney client privilege, attorney client communications, those will always be privileged and not be open. Um, any discussion on the matter, yeah. So I mean, there's a few in there, um, and th these exceptions are under uh, section six ten point zero two one. If you guys ever get really bored or want to put yourself to sleep at night, there's about twenty four. Or 23, I believe that you can read through and be like, my goodness. Um, so, but during closed meetings, obviously that you to in order to close a meeting, it, there that has to be on your normal agenda. Uh, it has to say that you're you plan on closing a meeting, you plan on closing a meeting, and you have to state the reason why, and you have to be very specific to this particular section that you're closing under. And of course, if you're closing under a certain certain topic, you have to stay on that topic. Uh, any discussion is closed. Uh, you can do a roll call vote. Uh, the keep very basic minutes. Obviously, a, a you know a closed meeting with with confidential discussions. You don't want to do verbatim minutes. That's that's probably not a good practice. Uh, you do would take a motion to close or excuse me. You would take a motion to go into a closed session, uh, and then when you're coming out of the closed session, you can make a motion to come back into an open session. Um, any actions that are reportable, you would put those on the record where you were talking to Ms. McCandless. Okay, this is the new slide that you guys don't have. Serial meetings. Um, board, members of a board may meet in less than a quorum. So when they're less than a quorum, they're not a, they don't constitute a public governmental body and therefore they cannot act. So it's not a meeting. Uh, it is okay to provide one-way communications to a board, such as an email or group text when someone is replying to that email you should never really reply to all because uh, once you do that you're kind of you know almost making this an unnoticed electronic meeting uh, i've noticed christina is now blind copying everyone on the meeting on the the emails which i think is is great because if you need to ask her a question you hit reply all you're only going to get christina um but you know board members can have discussions in less than a quorum for informational gathering purposes uh, but it must be very specifically just for information and you cannot have a discussion of what other members who are there, what they what they say, what their votes will be. Uh, so you don't want to turn your informal discussion for information, turn it into vote counting because there is a distinction between vote counting and just being aware of someone's feelings on a topic. Uh, so it's a, it's a slippery slope. And that's why you need to take, you know, take those types of conversations very, you know, very lightly. And just, you know, if you're just asking questions and what they think and how they feel about a certain topic, that's okay. But don't say, well, have you talked to so-and-so? What do they think? Are they going to vote yes or no? Um, so it, in practical terms, it, the best practice is to hold those discussions for an open meeting. However, as a matter of efficiency, it happens quite often that you know board members may discuss a topic or city staff may discuss a topic with another board member just to get a feeling and to get a sense of um, you know is this a topic we want to even bring up or do we think this is going to go further? Are you going to prepare more for that you know formal public meeting discussion? Does anybody have this, any questions on that one? Because that's kind of a that's a biggie. Okay. Well, this is Thank my much, yeah, This is my contact information. Um, you guys have my email address, so please, if there's anything that comes up and you have a question about certain aspects of the Sunshine Law, I'm more than happy to discuss. And you have a more detailed uh, summary in your packet, so just let me know. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You got it, Larry? Yeah. You, uh, yeah. We ready to go on? Yep. Okay, uh, reports, water department. 
Yes, uh, this is Dan Montgomery, Water Systems Director. Today, oh, uh, I've asked- hey, uh, Mr. Porter, could I jump in here real quick? I just wanna give you an update. It, so we are we are still live on City 7, but it's not streaming on YouTube right now. I just wanted everyone to know that, but it will be able to be posted later on YouTube. So we are live on City 7, but not on YouTube right now, okay? Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Dan. Okay, uh, again, I'm Dan Montgomery, Water Systems Director, and today I've asked uh, Deputy Director Matt McLaughlin. He'll be giving a presentation on replacing our water distribution system mains, and so I'll let Matt take over now. Good afternoon, members of the board. Uh, as Dan mentioned, my name is Matt McLaughlin, uh, Deputy Director of the Water Department. Appreciate the uh, chance to present some information to you on uh, main replacement uh, that we're doing in our distribution and the goals that we want to get to with our main replacement program. Um, and I'm going to try and share my screen here. Hopefully this works. And we'll go to here. Okay. Are you seeing the slide with the City of Independence Water Department on it? Yes. Okay. No. All right. <laughs> no? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm on the phone. <laughs> Those of you by phone will just have to try and follow along, I guess. If you, if you had the packet, you could have printed out the slides. It's in the agenda, by the way, if you can follow along on those. So, um, First off, this is just kind of a, a agenda, if you will, what I want to go over today. General overview of the, of the uh, system, uh, kind of what we see with water mains and uh, leaks and breaks on those mains, industry standards, and then our, our goals of where we're at now and where we want to be. General overview of our system, we've got uh, about 764 miles of, of main. Those mains are primarily made up of cast iron and ductile iron. Uh, they range in age all the way back from the early 1880s all the way to present day. Uh, we have a range in size from two inch to 36 inch. We do have a few short runs of like inch and a quarter, but primarily the sizes uh, go from two to 36 inch mains. Five pump stations in our system. We've got uh, the primary feed, the only feed to our, our system, uh, Courtney Bend water plant, 48 uh, million gallon per day, lime softening groundwater plant, um, which is located down Missouri River in M291. Uh, we've got three pump stations uh, located throughout the system, which are connected to ground storage reservoirs. We've got a 5 million gallon ground storage reservoir at 39th Street, and then two 2 million gallon ground storage reservoirs, one at 35th Street and the other one at Van Horn uh, area, which is next to our old uh, office building there at Truman and Forest. The last pump station we have is um, we've got a, uh, a booster station, which is located on uh, along Chrysler Avenue, south of 39th Street. This is there to simply boost the pressure of our uh, highest elevated section of our distribution system, which is uh, again, south of 39th Street uh, uh, to 40 Highway and then over to Blue Ridge. So it's just to provide a little additional pressure in that area for our customers. Um, approximately uh, 48 to 50,000 uh, retail customers we have in our system that we serve. Um, it, it varies depending upon, you know, move-ins, move-outs, and then our 12 wholesale customers, uh, which is the larger wholesale customers, the cities surrounding us, uh, and then on east to uh, rural water districts. Um, it's interesting to know that uh, between our residential customers and our wholesale customers, uh, it's about a 50-50 split um, inside and out. We average around 28 million gallons a day. Uh, so if you divide that in half, about 14 uh, million gallons per day is what our uh, citizens base is here in Independence. And then the surrounding communities are, are taking that other 14 on a, on a daily basis. Okay. Water mains, leaks and breaks, uh, approximately, and this is an average, about five breaks a week is what we see. Uh, some weeks we see none, others we can see 20 or 25. It all depends upon what's going on with the weather and whatnot, uh, how much we're pumping in the system. Um, real cold spell, spells, real hot spells, real dry spells, we'll see an increase in, in breaks typically, but it does vary. Um, it's, it's hard to predict. Uh, main breaks happen when they want to, any time of the day or night, uh, weekends, Christmas, uh, it all varies. 
Um, oftentimes we have to fix these lake leaks as soon as they happen. Uh, some we can set back and, and fix when it's more convenient for us, maybe a day later or not in the middle of the night, maybe the next day. But typically we have to uh, get them repaired as quickly as possible. They'll uh, interrupt flows of traffic. They'll cause damage, uh, flooding buildings, uh, houses, um, all kinds of things. So we have to get them uh, fixed. This time of the year, another thing we have to watch out for is it might be a small trickle, but that small trickle can turn into a real icy spot real quick. So uh, we have to fix leaks. We can't leave them run. Um, another part, uh, a big part of our distribution leaks is fixing what results from those leaks. We've got to restore all the yards, um, the streets, the driveways, sidewalks, all of those have to be done, which can be very time consuming. And also they can range from costs of, you know, 50 bucks to throw a little black dirt and seed and straw to a major state highway gets um, destroyed by a main break. You're, you're looking at anywhere from 50 to a hundred thousand dollars in just asphalt repairs. So, those uh, costs can add up real quickly. If you have a have a break, does that uh, mean that uh, the customers are, are out of water? Uh, it, it varies widely. Uh, we can go on a break and it uh, without any customers being affected. Um, also, it depends upon how we can repair the leak. Um, different types of breaks require different types of repairs. Um, some we can we can repair without ever dropping the pressure in the main. That's what we would prefer. Uh, we we ensure the uh, integrity of the water is not interrupted or, or compromised there. But in the event that um, it's a major break or a blowout, we will have to take down the main, uh, depressurize it. We do that in a safe manner to ensure that uh, again the water integrity is is remain good. Um, but uh, if we have to depressurize it, then yes, customers are most likely out of service. It depends upon how many service lines are on that section of main in between those valves that we use to isolate as well. So it, it varies widely on, on the repairs. But obviously that's the worst case scenario. Do you have any, any uh, numbers of how often that actually happens in a month or a year's time? Uh, I, I, not, not on an average basis. I, I'm sorry. I, um, it, it varies so widely. We, we, we do everything we can to avoid that, but there's sometimes that we just can't, we can't uh, repair it without doing that. But it's, it's probably, I mean, it, it's probably a 50, 50 on that uh, whenever we do a break. But um, when we take one down, if uh, concerning when we have to cut out pipe, depressurize and cut out pipe and put in a, a new section of pipe, um, we will excavate down below the main. Uh, we'll then pump that water and, and keep the water flowing until that is done uh, to avoid any kind of contamination to enter the main. So we, we have a process that we put in place to ensure that the safety of the water is, is protected. I don't, does that answer your question there? Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds like you, I'm just trying to get an idea of, of of uh, the seriousness of, from the customer's point of view, uh, you know, you know, from an IPL perspective, you know, when the line goes down, they don't have power, and, and of course that's, you know, that's that affects them. Uh, but I, I, I'm just trying to get an understanding how that would relate to water. If if, a, if you have a break, then and if you don't have water for an hour or five hours or whatever and how often that actually happens to our customers. That's, what, that's all, I was just trying to get an understanding of it. Matt, maybe I can help you out here. Sure. Uh, Garland, I, in my 33 years there, I can think of only one time we were at any point where we had to bring water in to people even. But as far as being out, there are so many valves in this city on the water we can reroute water around the brakes to the customers. You're talking about a minimum of, at times, maybe one or two customers without water for any period of time while the main is, is uh, repaired. Uh, I don't know of, uh, I can only think of one time, and that was quite a while back, that we had down for over six or seven hours, 
And at that time, we went and got water and brought it in to the customers and delivered it. Does that help? Okay. Yeah, we, we try and limit. If there is going to be an outage, again, we'll let the water flow as long as we can and keep pressure in the main until we get it excavated to the point where we're ready to make that uh, repair. So we try and limit the, the interruption of service as well. But it I can't guarantee that it, it's, it's, it can always be avoided. We try to avoid it. We try to limit the outage as much as possible. But just like on the, on the power side, like you're talking, um, there, there are things that, that happen. So we, uh, we try and avoid um, an all-out pressure interruption. We will have times where we will have minimal pressure, but we'll remain you know, uh, access to water for as long as possible. So, okay, but, thank uh, you. Okay, um, if I can pick back up where I was, I'm, I'm kind of lost track here, but um, industry break rates and replacement goals, uh, this is where we sit, where are we at today? Like I said earlier, about 764 miles of main in the system. Um, the average number of breaks that we experience in our system, if you take all the breaks that we have in a year with all the miles of pipe, it figures out to about a, a 0.34 breaks per mile. To put that, say that another way, for every three miles of main that we have, roughly, we're seeing a break per year. Um, when you look and we compare that with what's seen across North America, we are slightly above what the average is there, where they're seeing a 0.25 break per mile or about a, a break every four miles of main. So we want to see and we want to strive to get that ours back in line with what the rest of the country, uh, the rest of, of North America is seeing. Um, our uh, typical replacement, what we've been doing, we looked at the last three years, we're less than two miles of main replacement per year currently. Um, looking at what the industry standard is, what they're recommending, and when I say they, uh, we look at American Water Works Association, we also look at DIPRA or Ductile Iron Pipe Research Association. Because our system is all uh, completely made up of ductile iron and cast iron mains, uh, we look to them for, for uh, what they would say is a standard, and what they're saying is a properly designed system uh, should give you a 100-year service life. So if you take that and you divide that out by 100 years, we should be replacing 7.64 miles of main per year. We're far below that. We're less than two miles. Uh, that's where we're coming up with that 1% goal. So we our goal is to get up to that, closer to that 7 uh, seven mile to eight mile mark. How many of our of those 764 miles have been replaced? Well, it's an ongoing uh, situation. We, you know, when you say replaced, they they've been replaced at some time, but it it it, it continually. This is a never ending project, if you will. We we can't just say, okay, we're going to replace this and we'll never have to replace it again. Uh, like I said earlier, we have mains in service dating back to the 1880s um, and I'll get into that a little bit later when we talk about how do we prioritize which mains we need to replace at what time it's not always the old ones that are breaking actually the old ones it goes back to that old adage they don't build them like they used to the old ones from the 1880s the early 1900s don't give us the problems that the mains that were installed in the 1950s and 60s do uh, they did a I guess they, they lowered some of the, the standards on the piping back in the late 40s to 50s, early 60s, and those are the mains that are giving us the headache today. And unfortunately, um, if you kind of follow the baby boomer in, or, uh, time frame, that was when the country was really expanding. So we have a lot of those mains in our system that we've got to pay attention to. So that brings us to our next slide, uh, identifying and prioritizing the main replacement projects. Um, this is reaching our goal. How do we uh, identify those projects? Um, we're gonna, we know we're gonna have to figure out how to stretch our dollars as best we can. Uh, we're gonna do that using a balance of in-house and outside resources, both for the engineering and also the contracted work, and then the planning and budgeting for that. To go into a little bit further detail on our identifying and prioritizing projects, um, we use a triple bottom line approach. Um, those three uh, factors are listed there on the next slide, the likelihood of failure, consequence of failure, and benefit of replacement. 
The likelihood of failure um, is by far our uh, driving force right now. Uh, we've got lots of mains that gives us lots of problems. And Garland, as you were asking earlier, um, when we, how often do we have to interrupt our customers? Um, unfortunately, we do have to interrupt customers from time to time. There's just no way around it. Um, but we don't want to do it over and over and over to the same customer. Uh, unfortunately, there are mains that we're back after several months doing a, a section or a repair on a on a, a same block or a, a block down in the same neighborhood kind of thing. We want to get those mains, uh, we want to get those out of there as quickly as possible. That's an interruption to our customers. Um, it, it, it's costly. We're, we're constantly going back in. It's just not a good thing to do. So that likelihood of failure is driving factor right now. Uh, after that, we get to a consequence of failure. When these mains break, what is it impacting? Is it impacting a hospital, a care facility, a school? Is it a major traffic interruption? Is it difficult to access for, for us to make that repair? Meaning if it's difficult to access to it, our customers are gonna be out of service longer. So we wanna look at those kind of things. Uh, how does that negatively impact our customers? Uh, and then that's our next uh, factor that we're gonna be putting into this um, process to, to determine which main to replace. The last one's a benefit of replacement. It is important, but right now, um, it's not a driving factor, really. Um, these are things like, uh, what are the costs when we have to replace these? Um, is it uh, uh, an improvement to our system? Can we have a benefit? Say we, we get rid of a, a dead end or we get rid of a bottleneck in our system hydraulics. Um, there's, there's benefits to you know, removing them out of the asphalt and, and putting them into the grass, but is that the driving factor? Um, we, we do weigh that in on the process, but again, we go back to the likelihood of failure and the interruption to our customers. That's the driving factor right now. As I mentioned before, um, the failure is, is what we're mainly looking at, but these factors can change as we go through this uh, program. When we get the majority of these problem mains out of our system and replaced, um, these factors might change, and we need to continually look at these and revise them as we go. Maybe after we get some of the problem ones out, the consequence of failure becomes more of the driving factor, and the benefits can can be more important to us. But um, so we'll have to re-evaluate uh, this as we go through. But uh, as we another benefit to this is as we replace these mains reducing the number of main breaks with these problem mains, we'll be able to uh, focus our staff on the proactive tasks that we have in our system, more testing on our hydrants, making sure they're all working, uh, more, you know, just more painting, more replacement on our valves, more testing the valves, exercising programs to ensure that our system's operating more efficiently. <clears throat> Getting to the, uh, the construction documents, administration of those, um, as I said earlier, all mains are designed in-house and um, they are, uh, we are using no outside engineering forces at this point, um, up till now. We just recently, in order to, uh, to investigate what the cost of that going outside will be versus what we do inside, um, we have contracted with a couple of consulting firms to do a couple of projects that are, are up and coming, going to be getting replaced here shortly. So we know that in order to achieve that 1%, we're going to have to use some outside consulting. We can't do it all in-house. But as uh, we get through the process, we'll learn more what makes sense to do in-house versus outside, what's the best use of our dollars. Uh, that goes along with uh, the installation of projects, um, the, the contracting of the, uh, the construction phases. Right now, up to now, we've been using primarily outside contractors. We want to see what we can do with our forces inside, uh, the, the, uh, our, our own forces. Maybe it makes sense to do some of them in-house versus contracting them all out. So we've done some pilot studies, uh, some pilot projects. We're 
going through those to see how efficient we are versus using contracted forces. We're trying to make sure that we use the best combination of inside and outside to stretch our budget dollars as far as possible. This is our current and our future um, goals, I guess, where we are now and where we want to be. Uh, the average, we're right, averaging right now less than two miles of main replaced annually. Uh, we, that's what we're looking over the last three years. Uh, our goal, as I mentioned earlier, is up between seven and eight miles a year to stay on that 1% uh, time frame or 1% track. The average cost of my water main replacement, uh, we're looking at 800000 to a million dollars a mile. Um, so if you start doing the math, uh, down there in the bottom, we're currently spending less than $2 million a year. Uh, but in order to get to those that seven or eight uh, mile a year replacement uh, in the future, we're looking at six to seven million dollars, almost eight million dollars a year. Now, uh, I, I, I know nobody wants to hear it, but in order to sustain this program, um, we cannot likely do it at the current rate structure that we have here at the water department. Um, that's why we're wanting to look and see what is the best use of every dollar. If we do it as a combination of internal forces or resources and, you know, consulting and contracting out some of these replacements, we're trying to get the best, uh, combination of both of those to stretch those dollars as possible, as far as possible. In summary, um, the number of water main breaks in our system is above average for North America. Uh, we're replacing less than the industry recommended percentage. We want to get to that eight, per, eight miles a year or seven, between seven to eight miles a year to get on a 1% or a hundred year life cycle of these mains. Uh, we have a good system in place to identify and prioritize the main replacement projects. We've been tallying and, and keeping a good database of our, our main and break history since the 80s. Um, it's, it's really helping us out now to see, to track uh, which mains are giving us the problems. Um, we're currently evaluating the most cost effective way uh, to get these mains replaced. Um, and that is a combination we feel of both internal resources and external. And then that last statement, reaching our replacement goal will require vigilant monitoring of future regulations, careful planning for staff, equipment, consulting services, and potentially significant uh, increases to our annual capital improvement project, uh, or budget, I'm sorry. Uh, a couple other hurdles I want to mention to you so that you're aware of uh, future regulations or, and current regulations that uh, just recently got put into place. Um, the lead and copper rule was revised. It was uh, published, I believe, on December 28th of 2020. Um, we're sure we're not sure yet how much that is going to impact our budget, but it will have some um, impacts from it. We're gathering information. We're completing some uh, testing uh, right now, uh, reviewing the rule, the changes that just recently took into place. So that could have a budget impact on our uh, available budget to put towards our, our main replacement. Um, we've also got a. Uh, uh, Another project that uh, deals with our plant residuals, how we dispose of those plant residuals from the softening process. Um, that's been on uh, ongoing for several years, but uh, we do know that they are starting to work with some other utilities in the area. So it's only a matter of time before they, they come and, and start working with us for a, a new permitting process. That could have some implications on our budget as well. Um, we do have some some large capital projects, uh, one coming up that we'd, we'd like to begin the engineering on next year is a, uh, um, a standby generator for the plant to ensure that we can continue to provide water in a uh, the time of a total power output out, or uh, outage. So those are other things that we've got away with what's available for a main replacement. But uh, in the end, we, we know sometime down the future, in order to sustain something like this, we're most likely going to see uh, 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 impacts on our rate structure. So 
Um, sorry, I know I took you past your hour. I, I will stop there and, and field any questions if you if you have any. Thank Thanks, you, Matt. Matt. Matt, Matt. Or, yes, this is Larry. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for the report. Uh, one thing that needs to be touched on so everybody understands too. It isn't just like slapping a water main in uh, when you replace it. You have to connect all the services, new, the services back into the new main. Uh, are we doing? We're doing the taps on that, are we not? Yeah, we will. We work with the contractor after uh, we. Well, so we've got a project going right now in Walnut, um, and we do it in sections and, and get through there as quickly as possible. I, I know it is a, a huge interruption and, and you know inconvenience for the. The neighborhood but in the end i think they'd rather see the the main replaced and, and not having to deal with us coming back in and repairing yards and street all the time when when we get a main break going but well, yes uh it's it's yeah a i understand i understand that i just want everybody to understand that you have to make them connections back and do we re replace the copper uh to the service on that yes yes Okay, we're we're do are we doing that in house, or when we subcontract it out, do they do it? They they do it. The contractor is responsible for that. We'll make the tap, okay. and then they connect the they connect the copper service line back to it. But we make the tap, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions? So, Chairman Go ahead. Who is? Jack Looney. Jack, go ahead. Yes, uh, regarding this um, average number of water main breaks as compared to the national average, 0.34, I'd like to put that in perspective. Over the last decade, is it a factor that's being bettered, or is that a factor that's continuing to grow? Um, it, it's, I would say, continuing to grow. I, I don't have the numbers for you on that. I'm sorry, but... Um, Again, some years are worse than others. You you could pick uh, several years and they'd be very bad. But uh, I haven't done a ten year, if you will, uh, average on that. We went back the last three years. Um, there are some years that we have ran 500 breaks in a year. There are other years that we've ran 300 breaks in a year. Uh, that's what we're focusing on right now is our our troubled mains. I know that. Um, Actually, the last few years, we're, we're down a little bit uh, because we've had some mild weather. We haven't had the real harsh winters. We've had, uh, uh, you know, consistent rains throughout the summer. So our break rates have actually declined a little bit. I think if we went back farther, say 2012 was one of our extreme uh, or, or maybe the last drought, if you will. Um, our break rates, we saw, I, I believe, up over 500 breaks that year where we averaged down around 300. Um, in the last few. I, I understand, and I think you're coming in with a proposal here to try to help that. Uh, those things that you cite are also characteristics uh, experienced by other utilities, too, that have been down in the point two five range. Um, again, it, uh, uh, what you're asking for is investment in the utility here, and uh, kind of like to know whether historically whether we're becoming better or we're becoming worse. If you have an opportunity to enjoy seeing that uh, result. Okay. Well, I just, Matt, just make note that we, we are definitely not keeping up with the industry standard, so it has to be getting worse over time, whether it's this year or if you, you trend it out. But the fact is, is that we're not replacing enough to keep up with it, and ultimately we will have to do it, whether we're just kicking the can down the road or not. So. Yeah, I, I know, but any uh, slides here indicate you're going to be looking at uh, our citizenry to pay more for their water, so we want to be sure we're headed in the right direction. This is Bridget. Hey, May I ask a question? Go ahead, Bridget. Uh, Matt, so we're basically doing 25% of the repairs that we would expect, and we've given you 25% of the recommended budget to do that, which would make sense. Um, for other communities, I know across the country that are facing this same issue, how have they approached this? Have they done 
uh, a gradual rate increase and build up a bow wave of dollars so that they can go in and do multiple repairs? Uh, or do they um, begin their repairs immediately upon the rate increase? Um, just trying to understand how other people have approached this same issue. Yeah, it's a, it's a combination. Uh, I know people have tried different things, um, and I know that there's been challenges to keep a system like this, it, it is fairly aggressive uh, to, to try and replace a, a percent of your distribution piping, you know, per year. Uh, it's all on a scale. I know Kansas City uh, started theirs in the last couple of years, uh, and, and they're, I think, doing somewhere over 25 miles per year. So uh, some of the other ones that I've, I've talked to, they've also done a combination of inside and outside forces. Um, and, uh, but as far as the budgeting, I, I don't have a good, uh, feel for what other, what all the other utilities are, are doing or trying. Um, I know that, uh, some have done rate increases to, to meet this, but I can't say that they've all done that. Uh, I don't know if they've had enough funds or their rate structures in place in order to allow it, uh, in, in, on that. So I'm sorry, I don't, don't have a good answer for that. And when was the last time we did a rate increase for the water system? I believe the last one went into effect in 2016, Dan. Yes. Thank you. I have another I have question. Go ahead. Any other questions? Uh, Who? This is Mark McDonald. Um, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I got one question. Uh, have we gone back to the city and asked them to um, refinance their debt that they took out with you folks to refinance the uh, farmer's market? That should give you, you know, three or four million dollars there. Have we done that yet? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excuse me? Dan, did you hear Mark's question? Yes, so there, the city's continues to make payments on that, uh, and we could ask for that. With the fact that we have cash available, we wouldn't ask for that back until we had, we had spent down the money uh, to do that. So right now, they're paying us interest on that money, and so it's 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 working for us right now. Okay. We, we're good. I'd like to make a motion that uh, we freeze all capital projects at this time, until we get, at least we get the uh, resiliency and cash balance policy for WPC and water, because it seems like a lot of a lot of money going out. And I totally agree with your presentation. Uh, I'm just real concerned about the first thing we think about is rates and rates for a break there. And I and I know I I voted to raise rates with WPC several years ago, and um, I think I was uh, I was in wrong in voting that in. So I, I have a motion to, to recommend a capital budget freeze until the resiliency and task policy has been established for the water department. So Dan, you won't have any money available for a while. Mm -hmm. You might want to ask for that money back. Chairman, Chairman Porter, uh, this is Adam Norris. Can I can't hear anything. I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. I'm um, having issues too. This, this this line that we're on tonight is terrible. I, I couldn't hear yeah. that motion. It is terrible. I, I can't hear anything from it. This is ridiculous. This needs this to be done ridiculous. in person. Chairman Ford. Amen. I'm, I'm trying to answer. I don't know who's talking. This is Jack Looney with a question. Go ahead, Jack. This is to the water department. Uh, looking at your slide, it shows a six to seven million dollar future cost per mile for main replacement. I know the city has a history of departments standing alone. I'd like to encourage that big projects like this be run across the bow of the public works department and the other and the electric utility and the sewer department to see if there are advantages of others participating in the project and burial 
or replacement of street infrastructure, those type of things? We, we currently do. We sit in on a, a, a capital project uh, team that whenever there's a project such as such as these or a street replacement, uh, you know, upgrade of, the, of a neighborhood or a street, those are reviewed at that time. Thank you. I'm encouraged have, by that. Mr. Chairman? Is anybody else having trouble with their line on this thing? Uh, I am. Mr. Chair, this is Christina. Christina? Uh, can I just ask everybody to try to uh, mute their microphones? That might help a little bit. We're getting a lot of feedback. Sounds like... I have a question for the water department. If I Who's can this? this is Dave McDowell. On, Dave, on go this, ahead, please. On the 764 miles of water main, does that include the water mains that go to Blue Springs, Grain Valley, and Lee Summit? Yes. Are we responsible for that, the transmission, the whole distance, or do those cities pick up any of that cost? We're, we're responsible to our metering point. That didn't answer my question. Is the metering point in Independence, or is it in those particular cities? It's at the, I guess, the extent of our system, uh, it, it, and then it, it changes over to it depends upon wherever that wholesaler is fed from, but we are responsible <clears throat> to the water main up to that point. So once again, is are we paying for water mains that are in Lee Summit and Blue Springs and Grain Valley? Are we paying for those lines all the way to those cities? We're, we're paying for their mains up until the point where we make connection to them, but those mains to get them there they're paying for the mains as, as well as like the, the revenue we receive, we can replace those mains and this main replacement project would include the cost of the wholesalers portion. They, they're paying for that through their rates. And once it hits their metering pit from their distribution takes over from there. So city of Lee Summit may be just on the other side of the Little Blue River and then Lee Summit will pick it up and run it the rest of the way, including all of their distribution system. They may have 600, 700 miles of main on their side that they're taking care of, but the transmission main that we have is part of the cost, and that's part of the cost of service study when we do rates that sets that. So, yes, they do pay for the mains up into their meter pit. You see, I, I'm, I'm still, okay, my question still hasn't been answered. Where are these yep. meter pits located? Matt, Matt uh, let me interrupt uh, Dan. I think he's wanting to know, like, we have meter pits out on uh, 291, which the main is in, that part of the main up to the meter is actually in Lee Summit City Limits. Is that not right? Yes. So it, as soon as it goes under the Missouri River, or, I mean, the Little Blue River, then, then they we would have a meter pit some period after that. For instance, the city of Blue Springs, there's a line that runs on Pink Hill Road. That there's a right. park out there. So there's a meter pit on that particular transmission main. But that transmission main goes all the way out to Lafayette County to serve our other customers. When we, yeah. we used to be the Missouri Water Company, so we could serve outside of Independence. That's why we have these 12 wholesalers that are outside of Independence. We're not like the city of Independence Power and Light. We serve outside the city, and those transmission mains that get us get the water there the wholesalers are paying for those through their rates. Yeah, all that is because we were private to start with. And yes. that's what we did. Yes. Okay. So does so that the, help? The, the line, for instance, in Lafayette County that we serve, we, we have a line, the Pink Hill line or Truman Road line runs all the way out east, all the way to the county line. And at that point, it would be taken over by Lafayette County. Right. Is that, so we, did that answer your question, David? So basically, we, we've got of this maybe 764 miles, probably only 700 of it is inside Independence City Limits. I'd have to uh -huh. do the math on that because the other thing is, is all those transmission mains that run all the way to these locations, we have customers on them the whole distance. So we've, we've got 3,500 customers outside of the city limits of Independence that are on these transmission mains. So they're not only ours, but also the wholesalers. So 
we both contribute to maintaining those. But those are considerably cheaper to maintain than where you've got uh, buildings and streets already in place, aren't they? Well, yes, inside of a subdivision, you'll have, they're much smaller mains, so a typical subdivision would have six inch diameter mains. So yes, these 36, 24, and 12 inch, anything 12 inch and above, we consider transmission mains. So those could be going out to serve wholesalers and serve our customers. But there's a fine line between what percentage of those, but we could, we know that number, we could look it up, but I just don't have it right, readily available. Okay, thank you. That's all uh -huh. I've got. Thanks, Dave. Anybody else got questions for uh, Matt or Dan? I guess, you know, when we're considering a rate increase, I think there's lots of, obviously there's lots of issues that has to be considered. One is, how does that relate to other cities? It, the other thing is, you know, as I understand it, the sewer department, their rate is based upon the water rate. And I think in, in our sewer, it, that's not true. Well, I'm, I'm sure the sewer, the sewer department is based on their sewer cost, but we really don't cross lines as far as water no. and sewer. No, I, I understand that, but but isn't it uh, isn't there some relationship between the sewer? Um, maybe I maybe I'm misinformed on that. I'm sorry, Dan. Okay. Dan, Miss Larry, yes. Dan. Yes, Dan. Hello? Yes. Are you there, Larry? Yeah, I'm here. Uh, you're not, you're just presenting what we want to do on the mains. We're, you're not asking for a rate increase at this point, are you? Correct. All we're asking about is to let you know that we're looking to move forward to start ramping up over a period of time. We don't have the manpower or the staffing to, to handle going to a, you know, a $6 million a year type of a situation. What we're looking at doing is ramping up and over, over the next few years, continuing to increase these. We have cash available right now to uh, handle this, but over time to sustain it, we will have to have a rate increase. That would be the, the long term, but that would be down the road. That would be possible. We, we can't say that there'd be a rate increase. We don't know that. We don't know it, for yeah. sure. No, that's that's. I mean, it's the, like everything else. Everything goes up. Right. But. It, we, we would have to look at it and it's not going to sneak up on us. We will know over time and it's probably going to be years down the road uh, to, to handle that. So I don't see that's it any time. In that. This meeting is not over to get a rate increase. Absolutely not. That's not the intent. Okay, thank you. That's what I didn't clear it up. Anybody else got questions? Hearing none, do you want to go to the next topic? Larry. Larry? Yeah. This is hard. We're going on an hour and a half right now. I know, and it's ridiculous. I, I can't hear half the stuff. I made a motion and totally ignored because you couldn't hear me. Well, I know. I, I, I heard I heard motion, and then I didn't hear anything else. Yeah. I, I Did moved you have a second? We schedule next week if possible. I can't hear you. Hello? Hello. Can anybody else hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I, I hear you, Mark. Sure, just, Zach, I hear you. And hopefully something will be done with this line or we get a different line or maybe we'll open up the meeting. I don't know. But I, I recommend that we meet next week because we're, this thing is, still, is lining up on us. Yeah, I, I agree so hard. With it. I think we ought to... Is there any way we can? Adam, are you on? Yes, sir. Is there any way we can push the uh, city council or the mayor or somebody to just let us meet in at uh, Utility Center? It was, it was set up so well the last time we met there. I didn't have any problem. Uh, this is ridiculous uh, doing this, and we need to meet on a lot of stuff that's piling up on us right now. I, I Can you ask the mayor for that for me, or do you want me to call her? I will, I will pass on your request, but I do know that uh, uh, a recommendation or has, has been made that uh, 
through February, those meetings would be continue in virtual mode. Oh, Lordy. Mr. Chair, this is Christina. Can you hear me? Yeah, Christina. Uh, I might make a recommendation that a lot of times when there's too many people that have their audio on and they're not speaking, we hear background noise. Um, also, a lot of times when someone has their phone too close to their computer, there's some kind of feedback that happens. So if we could have everyone maybe move, if they're using their phones, maybe just move it away from your computer a little bit and also mute your microphones unless you're speaking and see if that helps any moving forward. I agree with you, but I've tried that and muting and I, it's, I, I don't know who else is not muting, but it's just, uh, well, okay, that's the best we can do. But between, between this meeting and whenever this board wants to meet again, um, maybe we can uh, work with each one of the board members to make sure um, to help help with any kind of technology issues. And if they're computer issues, we could try to help help work through that to ensure that you can get onto the Teams app and everything else to uh, to participate in the meeting in a, in a more fully. So between now and the next meeting, we, we can try to work with you all on that. That would help. Chris, uh, all right. Uh, I'd like to poll the uh, board. Could we meet, uh, close this meeting and meet again next Thursday and finish up on this uh, IPL and the rest of them and see if we can get a little better communications? Uh, Christina, would you poll the board on that? I can tell you that the 4th is, I am not available. I, I could make it on, on the 11th, but the 4th, I, I'm, I'm not available. I'm not available either. Anybody else? I can be. What about there, the week after that? I'll make myself available, whatever you need. I got to go. I'll, okay, I'll make myself available, whatever you need. Uh, Christina, what does the following week look like? After, not next week, but the week after that. Are you referring to the following Thursday? Yeah, not not next Thursday, but the following Thursday. Um, I mean, on my end, I think that would be fine. Um, we would probably well, I could send an email. I could send an email out to the board asking which day would be better for everyone and then you can make the decision. I could also make sure I check with staff that they're available. Okay, well, I mean, when you look at it, though, we're pushing clear up into the next one's the 17th anyway. Uh, if you do that, I'd appreciate it. We can do that. Uh, okay, so you want it, me to check on the 4th and the 11th with everyone and then get back to you? I appreciate it if you would. And okay. at this point, I ask for a motion to adjourn this meeting. Um, Mr. Chair, may I ask you a quick question, question please? Yes. Um, Go ahead. We, if, we need, if we would want to have a meeting next Thursday on the 4th, we would need to have it posted by Monday um, because staff is not available after Monday to post anything. So we would need to have the agenda discussed and finalized by tomorrow so I could prepare it to post on Monday. Is Let's that possible for, the, for next Thursday? Let's go for the 11th then. Okay. And may I ask a question? Go ahead. This is Bridget. Um, could I request that for the agenda for our meeting on the 11th that we also include the memorandum from Jim Nail um, to Zach Walker that was in our 21st uh, discussion packet? I don't understand what. So in the previous packet uh, for our meeting that had been scheduled and rescheduled to today, um, there was a memo from Jim Nail to Zach Walker uh, dated December 2nd uh, with a more fleshed out discussion of uh, some of the items that we had presented um, that some of the items that I had discussed 
uh, with the staff. And I wanted to be sure that we included that memo with the public items uh, for our 11th, February 11th meeting, please. That's fine. Can you do that, Christine? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Okay. Now I call here a motion to adjourn. I have one more quick question. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So That's we fine. had a motion on the floor by Mark McDonald. Are you wanting to delay that as well to the next meeting? Well, never, yeah, because I never did. We ever have a second on it? No. I never did hear a second yet. No. Okay, then we'll just put it off to the eleventh or whenever. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Meetings adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for the confusion. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you.